Hello friends, this is Self-Critical Automaton and this is episode 7 of uh, me playing Bayonetta, which is the beginning of chapter 3. Uh, let's jump right in. Love the superhero landing. If I was your child, I'd be an awfully ugly witch, wouldn't I? Yours is a face only a mother could love. And one I could never forget. If only I could remember where from. No quarrel. You're in no position to decide that. See, my infernal partners love my ability to eliminate your kind. I figure your sacrifice would shut them up for a while. Really unfortunate colour for lava. It's not, uh... It's not very nice to look at. <laughs> kind of looks a bit like something else, let's say. Um... It's piss. I'm saying it looks like piss. And that is entirely the character of my mood today, I guess. I am freezing cold because I chose to live in uh, the northeasternmost big city of Scotland, which is Aberdeen, in case you're wondering. It's August. I'm wearing two blankets and a hot water bottle. It's uh, not the best of moods. <laughs> Still, let's uh, do what we can here. So these guys are on fire, and enemies that are on fire actually can't be attacked normally. If you hit them with a, with an ordinary, uh, just standard melee attack, you do not in fact hit them, you bounce back off of them, they kind of have a, like an automatic block effect. So we're going to need to hit them while in witch time, or hit them with an angel weapon, or hit them with wicked weave attacks. That's actually one of the advantages to um, the Shiraba sword that I'm using, namely it has a three hit combo that ends in a wicked weave. Most wicked weaves normally um, occur later in longer combos, so let's see if I can just do one. Nope, that was not it at all. Oh, also you can do this. You know, just for maximum disrespect. Alright, give me a dodge, come on. There we go. So, I'm pretty bad at fighting these guys for the same reasons I'm, you know, bad at the special challenges that involve you only being able to damage during which time, namely, I'm not perfect at the dodge timings. But, um, yeah. There's also the additional challenge of this game, uh, well, this fight finally giving you environmental challenges while you fight, which is quite irritating because most of your attacks also involve you physically moving. In fact, I think hitting these guys does damage to you. Um, hmm, not bad as a finisher goes. Um, naturally games like this are all about, well, at the very least, this specific game is all- oh, ooh, stone. Yeah, I did take a lot of damage. That's not a great performance, i got to say. But, um, yeah, games like this are kind of all about, uh, looking cool, and, um, Bayonetta makes that the most, um, unambiguous, what with the little eye catches and camera snaps at the end of every combat. Anyway, this cra trash can is very important. As you may have noticed, it made this portal over here appear when I smashed it. So, that is one of the things I've been saying about this game, which is that it has a lot of things hidden in it, but the ways they're hidden are really kind of arbitrary and hard to find for the most part. Now, with a bit of luck, I'll first try this, but I'm still going to record my dialogue afterwards, just in case. This is actually really quick, and it's probably the easiest of all of the challenge rooms. Um, at least this kind of them is easy. Later on we'll be seeing some more of them that have uh, 
you know, much harder time limits, but by that point we will have the Kasheldra Whip weapon, which makes these completely trivial, and that will be clear at the time. But, uh, yeah, the main difficulty is, you know, just keeping up in the air. But you can Mario stomp on enemies to get more airtime, and you can slow your falling with uh, the guns, so that is pretty much all there is to say about this one. And there we go. Um, that one is pretty easy. It's, uh, yeah, not a huge trouble. Suddenly realised I was about to say things that I will probably say when I'm recording the dub audio to go over the top of it. Oh well. Alright, straight back into the level. So this is the first time we have, like, environmental hazards. And it's also the first time that they're mixed into combat challenges, which means it's quite easy to accidentally take a whole bunch of extra damage when you're fighting, because... Um, yeah, it's easy to step on that stuff. This is also... Oh, I was talking about amnesiac protagonists. No, I wasn't. Uh, I was going to talk about amnesiac protagonists. So, one of the advantages to an amnesiac protagonist, which Bayonetta absolutely is, is that um, for all that it's commonly criticised as being like a really cheap cop-out sort of a way to have a, a character in your story, the thing about amnesiac protagonists in games is that, quite simply, if the protagonist is an amnesiac, they are having exactly the same experience as the player. This is advantageous for a bunch of reasons. Essentially, um, one of the most like difficult problems to solve in game design is making the player feel like they are the character. You know, if a character is very different from who you are, then it's hard to identify with them, and you want to identify more with a character that you are literally moving around and controlling. Also, new enemy type. I kind of hate fighting these guys for reasons that will soon become obvious. Also, another instance of the old, um, it attacks you in a cutscene, hope you manage to dodge in time when the cutscene is over. So, what was I saying? Um, amnesiac protagonists. So, it's generally considered to be such a kind of, um, a cliche to have an amnesiac protagonist, but like I said, in games it actually solves a very legitimate problem. Namely, you know, how do you get a character who... How do you get the player to feel like they, you know, are the character? Well, by necessity you have to explain to the player what's going on as you go. Oh, oh okay, the barrier's still up. So if you have to explain to the player as you go um, everything that's happening, then you end up having a character be like, as you know, this, 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 this. And that's infuriating because why are they just repeating all of this stuff that you ostensibly already know? Well, because the player doesn't know that. If you have an amnesiac protagonist, then conveniently you have a um, character who's as in the dark about it as the player is and therefore you can just explain everything to the character. Like, I do think it's a cliche, I do think it's overused, and I do think that's not ideal. However, you know, it, it does actually serve more of a purpose than in other forms of media or literature. And um, by literature, like, I consider all kind of narrative media to be literature for, you know, critical interpretation purposes or what have you. Um, there's also bad signposting because can you step on those narrow cracks? Is it only the big pools that look, see, I'm standing in the lava but I'm not taking damage. There's a lot of bad signposting in this game during the kind of environmental exploration and platforming sections. More of which will be talked about probably in the next episode. But first... Oh, let's see what this says. Yep, that's pretty reasonable. So that's where we were at the end of the last one. So we didn't actually go very far. We mostly went straight up and back down again. But, uh, yep, up here is the next portal. With a bit of luck I should be able to first try this one as well, but it's a bit harder. So yeah, this one is very easy as well. This is the first one where we have to only use angel weapons. Angel weapons do more damage than your weapons do anyway, and you have a generous time limit. So really the difficulty here is can you kill them all without getting hit more than three times, which again is pretty easy considering you have plenty of angel weapons to work with. This would be more challenging if you had to actually get the angel weapons from 
the uh, the opponents, which would you know re re require you to be careful with your torture attack timings and make sure you actually you know juggle them properly, that kind of thing. However, it provides three, and they're all quite effective. Uh, the sword there is from an enemy that won't even show up for another whole chapter, which is, does a huge amount of damage, as you can see. Uh, the bow is very useful because its light attack is um, a large AoE slash, and the heavy attack is actually a ranged attack that can hit multiple targets. Um, and of course the staff has a heavy attack that hits everything for a ton of damage, as you can see here. So this is honestly one of the easiest challenge rooms in the game. So yeah, there's not really very much to say beyond that. It's just kind of a pretty easy fight in a room with a whole bunch of really easy weapons to make it even easier. You just gotta wail on them until they're all dead. It is kind of difficult to build up a decent combo score on this because, well, quite simply, uh, the angel weapons frequently have slow combos and they break very quickly, but, you know, the weapons themselves build up quite high amounts of combo even with small hits, so even that's not a huge problem provided you make sure you, you know, jump from location to location nice and fast and always have one in hand. Not the most stylishly inspiring ending to this guy. Also, frustratingly, you can't take weapons that you gain in these challenges away with you, which is just disappointing because, like, uh, those beloveds, the axes they drop do so much damage in such a huge AoE, they're really fun to use, but they're quite difficult to get a hold of. I, um did actually manage, when I was playing this casually, to just like, um, just in time grab his axe before it despawns, but unfortunately it just is, does just despawn off your character model as well. So yeah, um, this is up to this point pretty much just the same level, but now we get some fun set pieces as we move on into the next zone. Uh, let's just dip into the shop real quick. I don't think there's anything I want to get, but... You bring me enough of these halos, and maybe I can buy a ticket to space. Always wanted to be a bald space marine. <laughs> what can I do for you anyways? Well, gee, I wonder what game that's in reference to. So, yeah, I'm pretty sure there's still nothing new here that I want to grab. There's still the same techniques available. I might take Breakdance, just because it's fun. So, it's literally just if you hold down dodge, you can attack out of your dodge. Love the eye catch. Um, so I'm just going to grab that. I probably won't remember to do it very much, but it's still better to have it than not have it. I'm not going to get any of these. Can't afford any of these. I still haven't decided what one I'll get if I do get one. Um, but yeah, so time to zoom straight along with this level. Oh, straight into there. Okay. So an interesting fact about the environmental damage is that, um, hang on, did I get it? Yes I did. So that puzzle's quite frustrating because it's on a separate timer to the, uh, I honestly thought that was going to be a combat, oh well. So yep, that tiny cutscene is just to get you on the wall. Um, so, god, what was I saying? I was saying something about the environment? <sighs> okay, anyway, so I do think... Oh no, I was talking about the puzzle. So the frustrating thing about that puzzle is that it's um, it can be quite difficult to get the timing right because you have to time your um, usage of the dodge just to the openings in the sort of like spurting lava and um, yeah it takes a couple seconds for it to actually you know trigger on you so that you can dodge it which means that of course if you don't time it right you just go in the lava. Uh, it should also be noted that um, while you do take damage from environmental threats if you're not actually in a combat or action section namely oh god ah. Didn't know that could happen. Okay, wow. Um, 
But yeah, so if you are in a combat sequence, which means that there is uh, a verse up in the top right hand corner, then those are, those are the sort of chunks of the game that you get graded on, incidentally. They're mostly combat sequences, but occasionally they have some of these platforming components included. Anyway, so, what was I saying? Yeah, the, um, those sequences basically, uh, if you aren't in, oh god, oh Jesus, oh disastrous. Well that's it folks, the, um, the game ends here, that's, that's the end of it, it's impossible to get past this section. I'm kidding, obviously. Mind you, I do think that uh, quick time events are really irritating, and I think they are a bad mechanic for a lot of reasons that are very rarely used well. I think they're kind of just arbitrarily included in this because it's a thing games have. Let's see if I can get it. Ah, yep. So, yeah, you know, if you fail it, it's just an immediate game over. So that's a just an immediate huge penalty to the end of your. Um, you know, to your assessment at the end of the level, which is frustrating. Big hole. Is that? Okay, this is just pouring into the ocean. Okay, that's probably fine. That's how new land is made, after all. Time to grab this. About the Umber Witches 2. Umber Witches, controllers of the Dark Power. The ways of their discipline were actually quite varied. Breathing, movement, medicine, and tactics were joined in the Middle Ages by the training and operation of heavy weapons. Excuse me? Define heavy weapons in the Middle Ages. Did they used to strap, like, full-on six-foot culverins to each leg? What? Or is that just big swords? I... Did they used to operate cannon crews? Anyway, uh, this culminated in a curriculum whose total breadth and intensity are hard to ascertain. This training forged both the body and the soul, which it would, considering an enormous cast iron cannon is pretty heavy, um, honing each into a vessel capable of withstanding the rigours of the magical arts, and allowing one to begin to interact with other dwellers of the magical realm. That, that phrase means something. Um, unfortunate. This interaction with the world of spirits lies at the very core of magic. To put these dwellers of the magical realm, there it is again, into layman's terms, they most closely fit the common conception of demons. Developing demon-like powers, it seems like this was one of the reasons these women were burdened with a sad fate, always living in history's shadows. I've been able to gain no further solid information regarding the magical arts. As the witch clan has long since been annihilated and their memory forgotten, the residents of this town detest them with all their hearts. To allude to their existence is quite the taboo. Yet the key to unlocking the witch's mysteries still remains. In Vigrid, the man held up by many to be a paragon of the faith continues to seek out any remaining witches. Are the witches, once thought to be wiped from the earth, still amongst us? If they are, how have they survived this long? What do they now know? And where on earth could they be hiding? Finally, I have obtained scraps of a document that appears to lay out another elementary principle of the magical arts. I am unable to decipher the writing on the document, but it seems to describe a martial arts technique known as Dodge Offset. I pray it will be of use to someone, so I have included it within these notes. And then it teaches you how to do it. Incidentally, all of your, like, addable moves are toggleable on and off, so if you find one keeps interrupting your combos accidentally, you can switch it off, which is just a nice, you know, quality of life feature. But, uh, dodge offset I am terrible at, and I have never been able to figure out how to do properly. It essentially means that if you dodge in the middle of a combo and time it right, you can, can you can resume your combo after the dodge completes. Um, am I, I think I'm missing one of these somewhere. Anyway, I'm not sure. While I'm here, let's take a look at the new angels. So, uh, oh, okay, I actually haven't gone through any of these. I tell you what, I will do that another time. Right, time for, look, this, this looks awfully like a, a big combat arena, right? Well, you are correct for thinking so. Um, I didn't know you could break dance in cutscenes. Good to know. So, time to fight two of these. I'm going to start by yeeting this at them. I like that it just immediately gives you some combo points, but doesn't actually give you a combat marker on the thingy. So, these guys' attacks happen really fast. They move very slowly, but then when they jump into attack, it's kind of... Um, 
difficult to dodge, and especially when they're grouped up together, it's very difficult to uh, differentiate them from one another. But fortunately, I can do this. So all of the different kind of physical classes of enemies. So, oh, by the way, that attack stuns you if you aren't like in the middle of a dodge when it happens. Which usually just lets them get a couple free hits in, infuriatingly. Great. Ah! Luckily he missed me. He stunned himself on the fountain like an idiot. Let's end him. Now that is how you get a good eye catch on the end of a combat. I do love that this game incentivizes you to um, try and pull off a, a stylish finishing move to knock the last little bit of health off of an enemy. Um, it's a game that's all about looking cool, and it encourages you to do that, so I think that's pretty dope. Now, I'm not a physicist, so I don't know if this would work, but I want to believe it does. I also like that she can, you know, slap around giant slabs of concrete, but she can't, like, you know easily dodge what even what even was that like lava she can't go through some lava anyway as every gamer knows whenever you enter a new area always look behind you because there might be a tunnel with a secret in it it's such a common um game design trick it's kind of ridiculous um i also love that the visual aesthetic of this level completely mismatches her uh, there's quite a few instances of that in the game she looks like she is just off the fashion runway and in fact, I want to talk about her visual design at some point, because there's a lot of interesting aspects to it. But this is like a some kind of goblin cave. It's kind of ridiculous. Um, and she absolutely just... There is a huge mismatch between her appearance and the kind of locations that she's in. She This looks like a sort of a generic fantasy location with generic fantasy enemies, but she looks like that, you know? Like, this might as well be... Um, you know, a God of War level, or even a kind of a RPG type level or something, but uh, not that you have levels in RPGs. Well, you do have levels in RPGs, but not that kind of level. Uh, I'm getting off track. So, this is just about going to be the end of this episode in a second, but we're going to go to the shop first, and uh, have a quick look out here as well. So, time to go check in. I want to hit up every one of these shops just in case. You here for business or pleasure? Either way, I'll hook you up. Does that imply that they slept together at some point? That's probably a stretch, right? Um, yeah, there's not actually anything I want to buy. Just wanted to see his face. Ah, my good, good friend. He's kind of husband material, but he, he does just give me gay vibes. I don't know why. Um, anyway, so that's going to be it for today. See you later. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe. And there's links to my other projects in the description. Thank you so much for watching.